The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hello and welcome to episode 29 of the Cinematography Podcast. Episode 29. Yes, that's our thing that we do. <laughs> that's what we do. That. <laughs> one person says it, the other one repeats it. <laughs> hey, Ilya, how the hell are you doing? <laughs> how the hell are you doing? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing good. You know, uh, having a baby has not uh, surprising. Like when, when people haven't been to L.A., I always tell them the one thing that'll really live up to your expectations is the traffic. traffic. Yeah, traffic. Traffic is as bad as anyone says. Worse. Every, everything else is not what you think it is. No, not nearly as bad as you think it is. Not even nearly as weird or as whatever. It's yeah, that's not, right. Well, it's really not as weird. The people aren't as good looking. No. They just look like normal people, most of them. Right. Uh, so the Angelina does, <laughs> does not look like everyone else, but... but. <laughs> Oh, not Angeline. Angelina. Angelina. Yeah. yeah. Angeline doesn't look like everyone else either. But no, no, she, yeah. she, she doesn't at all. I saw her drive another <laughs> the other day. So with, with the babies, everybody who's ever had a baby has told me a different story. But the one thing that has lived up to its uh, reputation is the sleep situation. Mm. And if I may say a secondary thing, the going to movies. Oh, yeah. I've seen exactly four movies since Madden was born. And one of them was Bohemian Rhapsody, which I saw because we were interviewing Tom Siegel. That's right. And one of them was Deadpool too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, we, we saw that at a mommy and me screening with the baby when he was brand new. All right. So, Ben, who's on the show today? Well, today we just have an embarrassment of riches on the show lately. Uh, and frankly, since we started, but I never dreamed that we would get Vittorio Storaro on the show. He's just he's a legend. He's a legend. As you said yesterday, in the ASC's top 100 most influential movies of the last century, he was listed four five, times? Five times. Five times. And two of those times were in the top 10 of like yeah. the most influential movies. He's so. sim- simply amazing. And this is an interview you conducted. I am eight shades of jealous that I did not get to interview him because <laughs> you, you got to interview a lot of a lot of the white whale kind of DPs who I've always wanted to talk to. Don't, don't worry. There, there's plenty more. No, of course. Of course. But like you got to interview Maddie Lee Batique and they're like Maddie Lee Batique is one of those DPs that I would go see a movie just because he shot it and mm. I do it all the time. Nice. But as far as Vittorio Storaro goes, he is in the pantheon of some of the greatest DPs who ever lived. And uh, just to, you know, breathe the same air as that guy for 10 minutes sounds pretty awesome to me. Well, it's a good interview. It's not it's not our longest interview. We only had Vittorio for a limited amount of time, but we cover a lot of ground. He talks about his uh, his early days and I'm not going to give anything else away. I'm going to just, you know, let him speak for himself. Well, here we go. Without further ado, here is legendary cinematographer. Oh, wait a second. I also have to mention one other thing. Oh, no. Why? What's that? What's that? <laughs> uh, with legendary cinematographer Vittorio Storaro is actually my former boss, Rob Hummel. I used to, oh, yeah. to work for him uh, over at Dalsa. He in the technical circles of this industry, sort of a legend in his own right and uh, a lot of people know him he is uh, the editor of the American Cinematographer Manual and I believe he might be actually doing another version of the American Cinematographer Manual I'm not really 100% sure but I think he I think he's involved in that and uh, he is just an all around technical uh, wizard and I know that he is a resource for all kinds of people so you will hear Rob Hummel uh, chime in and I do mention him in the, the beginning and he tells a fantastic story which if anyone was listening last week got to get a little preview of and uh, without further ado Vittorio Storaro and Rob Hummel <laughs> The Cinematography Podcast Interview. Vittorio, thank you so much for being on the show. You have done about everything one can do with cinematography. You worked in multiple genres, won multiple Academy Awards, won BAFTAs and Golden Frogs and you name it, even wrote a book. Where did you get started in all this? Where does your passion for this industry come from? Let's say that uh, I was pushed into study photography when I was 11 from my father. I didn't know even what the word photography means. Step by step, uh, I learned, I enjoyed, I did five years of study. My father they was working on a major company in Italy, it was called Luxfilm, asked to one of the greatest cinematographers at that time, engineer Piero Voltalupi, to see if I can be one of his assistants. 
and uh, that I was already almost f- practically finished the five years course. I was a teacher of photography, and I received the best no in my life. He said, no, Renato, my father's name, Vittorio, your son, studied photography, but in my opinion, he's supposed to study cinematography before I take him as an as a first as one of the, my as own assistant. So I think he should go to Centro Sperimentale di Cinematografia in Italy, in Rome, and after that we can talk about. And I learned how sometimes in life uh, is so much important uh, an obstacle or a no or something to lead you in the right direction. I remember that um, several years ago, Owen Roisman invited me to do a seminar at the uh, UCLA. And, uh, and they say, Owen, what we can do? Well, you know, normally we screen a movie after you can discuss the, with the um, answers and questions to the students. And I said, well, I, that's what we normally do every time. Uh, not personally myself, I like this way. Can I do something un- uneasy? I said, okay, do whatever you like. And I said to them, the important to say no. Okay, so the importance of no. Do you have an example that you can share? Um, when I was uh, pretty young, finish uh, after the five years of studying photography, four years of cinematography, two in a very small film school. One was the main school in Europe, which was the Centro Sperimentale in Rome. Francis Coppola told me they was dreaming to come to study in that kind of school in Rome. After that, I started in the professional and I was very, very fast. I gained the different step to be a second assistant, first assistant, camera operator. Okay, so you were working as a assistant and an operator. When do you become a cinematographer? In one year time, a cinematographer said to me, Vittorio, you know too much compared to any other people, so jump, be the camera operator. I was 21 years old, and, uh, and I said, well, because during the Centro Sperimentale we were using the big Mitchell with the world ahead or whatever. And I said, okay, but I need your help. He said, don't worry, Vittorio, I'll be next to you. But from that moment on, I was uh, so intriguing to speaking with the director about the style of shooting. So I was really concerned about the composition of the images and the rhythm of the, of the movement of the camera. And uh, that's why recently, since my recently is more than 30 years ago, I love to uh, address myself for somebody that is writing with the camera. Vittorio, you have previously spoken about how cinema is different from other forms of art. Uh, could you elaborate on that a bit? Photography is an expression in one single image, like a painter, like a musician, like a writer, you, you are in your own. Cinematography is a part of, like, of an orchestra that needs several artists, several different areas, several different art. Art from Latin means ability. So my own ability was really in film photography. Cinematography means that uh, I need not to have a very good image or frame, but you need to tell the story like the musician do with his own uh, note, the writer with his own world. You have your visual vocabulary, light, shadows at the beginning, and what is the combination between the two two of them, which is color. Using those kind of articulation of of your vocabulary, you need to making a, a kind of journey from the beginning to develop a concept uh, and to ending with some kind of a completed idea, completed concept. Practically, you have to follow the main concept of the film according to the general style that you discuss with the director. Never forget the director is like a, a director of an orchestra. Each one of us is a, a, a soloist but we cannot do anything unless we have a, the final agreement with the director. That's what is my own concern all the time. Several directors was, uh, asked me to become a cinematographer while I was a camera operator. 
And I said no, because um, I was not in a hurry. Don't forget my family was very poor. I was uh, 11 years old. My father said to me, I don't know if I have money enough to keep you as a student. So I went to a lab photography laboratory, cleaning the floor, cleaning the, 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 the mat, starting to the process of photography as a little child, let's say. And I was in a, any years of my study, in the morning I was studying, in the afternoon I was working in order to keep myself in as a student. And, uh, and I say no to several directors because probably I'd, I felt that I was not ready. I felt that I need to understand very well the composition of an image uh, because I saw one painting that struck me in my uh, very young age, which was a, a painting of Caravaggio called the, the, the Colino San Matteo. And I realized that I was a, a very well um, constructed in technology, but I didn't know anything about art. So I said, oh, no, I want to understand what is the composition of an image. I want to understand the, 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 the language in order to tell the story <clears throat> through the movement and the rhythm that concerns music. Some kind of art that I didn't know in nine years of study that I did only about technology. And those kind of no, practically, um, I, I said to the many young directors, the movie, I don't want to do it, and they're waiting for the right one. And I was lucky enough that um, I was still uh, young enough, I was 28, the, the very good cinema uh, director, Franco Rossi. Franco Rossi made some very good picture in Italy, very serious director. He was, came in the United States, he made Smog with uh, Ted McCord. Ted McCord, I remember that well, in watching his movie, they did the East of Eden uh, with Lia Kazan. Ted McCord was the cinematographer for Sound of Music and Treasure of the Sierra Madre, East of Eden, like you said. To me, it was an incredible uh, presentation in the way that you can use the cinemascope area in the way that you can frame and follow the composition according to the story. He shocked me. And I said, oh my God, I'm going to start a movie with somebody just working with Ted McCall, which is for me was uh, incredible. But um, I said, I, I think that he need now, it, it, the story is about the conflict between two generations. The film was in black and white. I was lucky there was black and white because in any school that I did, nobody was teaching me about color. At that time, nobody was teaching you in color. And that black and white movie you did with uh, Franco Rossi was called Youth March in 1969. And um, I, I was uh, putting all my energy through the emotion in the way to um, perform in that kind of picture. But at the beginning, 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 uh, the director said, Vittorio, we have to do two days of uh, um, test. I would like to select two young boys and one girl uh, for the picture because uh, coming, the picture come, was coming from my book. Um, and that's why I also need you that you are the same generation, so on and so on. And at the beginning of the day, I, I, with very little, we were in two little apartment to do some tests. And I was trying to use light in the way that I was thinking to visualize the picture. It was a test for me, not the test, but the chance to me to prepare myself and do some tests. At the end of the day, the director became very uh, uh, nervous because he couldn't find uh, the right girl. And at one point he says, Vittorio, put me a light over there so I can see her in all her problem, all with this kind of, of, of um, visualization you try to do. I don't understand if she's good or not. For me, it was a shock. I said to the gaffer, to the Letitia, was only one, you, you heard the director, so put the light where he said, I don't want to even be involved. They, we, they did this kind of a close up, and after we finish, and he said, okay, we see you, t we see you all, all each other tomorrow morning. I said, no, Mr. Rossi, thank you very much. I was 28. My wife was waiting for our second child. We are no more than $90 in the bank. 
And I said, you don't need me. You need a, a, a gaffer. No, you don't need the cinematographer. <laughs> uh, so tomorrow I'm not coming. And he said, sorry, Vittorio. I was so nervous about it. But please, you, I saw what you were doing. It was fantastic. I love it. Don't worry. Forgive me. I said, no. I said, no, no. Come tomorrow because I, I, will, I love what you're doing. So he convinced me to come back the day after. And he said, in case I might need not to see the character, but to see the physical person, I tap you. So you know that uh, I need to see her and, or she or he, whatever, uh, in the way they are, not in the way they're supposed to be on screen later. The best movie of my life. <laughs> that's no, this that's is only one episode. I have other episodes to tell you. That's well, a great I, I story. Remember, that's a great story. I remember uh, so, uh, regarding saying no. I remember on Dick Tracy that at, at Disney, part of uh, Vittorio's palette is his film laboratory. And his film laboratory at that time in the days of film was Technicolor. So uh, at the time, the Disney studio owned a film lab called Metrocolor. And Warren Beatty was going to direct uh, Dick Tracy for the Disney studio, and he wanted Vittorio Serrano to be a cinematographer. So Vittorio said, well, if I'm going to shoot your movie, I must use Technicolor. So they had a big meeting. Do you remember this meeting? It was Michael Eisner, Frank Wells, Marty Katz, Jeffrey Katzenberg, Some uh, names. Warren Beatty. And I was there along with uh, Dave McCann, who was head of post-production. And they wanted me there because they knew I knew Vittorio. And they, they told me before this that I was supposed to convince Vittorio to use uh, Metrocolor Labs. And I said, I, I won't even try. <laughs> because, <laughs> because uh, so, so Michael Eisner in the meeting gives this whole presentation of how much money they will save if they use Metrocolor. And how that, so clearly Vittorio, you see, we have no choice. We, ha we can't use Technicolor. They're so much more expensive. Well, we have to use Metrocolor where we'll save money. Also uh, because we only use ENR. Yeah, yeah, and, and also, <laughs> yeah, and, and you want to use ENR, which is a, System. a unique process. Other people call it bleach by bypass, but Technicolor's was slightly different. And, and the, but the best part was Michael Eisner makes this whole pitch, and, and Vittorio stands up and graciously says, you know, Dick Tracy, I'm tempted to imitate you, but Dick Tracy is a wonderful movie. Warren is an amazing director. And with the Walt Disney Studio, this movie will be a wonderful motion picture. Unfortunately, not with Vittorio Storaro. <laughs> and he turned and walked out of the conference room, and, and Michael Eisner jumped out of his chair and chased him down the hallway. <laughs> he was great later, Michael Eisner. When Francis Coppola in <clears throat> in, uh, invite me to do Capitanio at the oh, Union. Yeah. Los Hermanos gave me the opportunity to bring my, uh, myself, uh, in, because I was not into the Union at the time. He sued uh, the Union, Michael Asner, in court. Really? And the court said, <laughs> at the Union, out. You cannot stop Mr. Francis Coppola or Disney to have some kind of collaborator, even if it's international, to bring something that the, the um, uh, director like Francis Coppola needed. And oh. they gave me the, the, the chance to work to do Capitanio. Anyhow, to finish your questions, what I tried yes. to say, I didn't know at that time, of course. I was too young, I was too... Uh, innocent, uh, some, probably I was even arrogant sometimes. When you are younger, you, you don't really are in balance with your emotions sometimes. What I do really think that what my father did when he said to me, go to study photography or whatever, he put his own dream on my shoulder. When you have something on your shoulder, it becomes part of yours. Um, main concern now, you really care. Uh, what I usually say to assistants, students, children, even grandchildren now, uh, love what you do, what you study. Try to be part completely of what you love, because in this way you don't have any more difference what is your duty or your pleasure. It's a mix like that. So practically, you can do some time Making films sometimes is not easy. Sometimes it's very hard. Sometimes it's difficult. Uh, but you don't feel the effort if you want to do it, if you love to do it. In doing that, when you present to a, a, a director an idea, I know very well the idea is not yet an idea when you have it in your mind. 
but you have to find the right word to present them in order that you can to accept this concept uh, and you can say okay we can pursue it in your idea now we believe at this moment you carry this idea on your back and you you start to suffer maybe you don't even sleep at night you try to convince all your collaborators to do it uh, in order to do it why because i think that in any profession that we do anything we do is part of our own life in the way that uh, we try to understand ourselves if we are able to if we can make it even one step forward if we we, we try to in choosing in any kind of profession what we uh, are concerned us you try to under, to um, give answer to your own questions you try to understand the meaning in your own life Vittorio, uh, one of the reasons you and Rob are sitting here right now is to talk about film preservation. Um, I, when did that first become uh, something you were aware of? When uh, in um, 1980, for, I was in Los Angeles doing a, a one from the art, and I heard uh, Martin Scorsese talking about the problem about colorization, that the, the movie was losing color. Probably he meant at that time about positive color. And, uh, and, uh, and speaking with other people at the time, they said, yes, but you know, thin color is not of print, uh, um, necessarily need to have a longer life because it's been screened so many times, it's been scratched and so on. We have a, a better positive stock just for the archive. I convinced Francis Coppola to print any print of one from the art in that kind of stock because you say, Francis, we never know later when one print will go in the archive or go to a, uh, in your vault or, or going to be seen by somebody. He accepted to do that. A Kodak, I was very happy they understood that. Uh, and later moved <coughs> the standard film in that archive standard. Believe me, it was not an archival element. It was just a little better. From that moment on, uh, I was so concerned about uh, the... Um, the, the conservation, preservation, is better conservation or preservation of images? Preservation. Preservation. Preservation, preservation of the images. And, uh, and I, I realized that in the United States, that the only way to do it is was to use a very old uh, technical system, which is sil silver master separation. Taking from any uh, reality, which was the original technical tree, the system, or from a, an, an original negative, to pull out the, the, the memory of red, green, and blue on a black and white uh, uh, positive. Why this become more permanent? Because black is made by silver. Silver is an element, so it doesn't fade. And later, with the, the, uh, the three complementary colors, you can rebuild any new element anytime you want. So from that moment on, I was put in my contract that we have to have silver master separation. Later, I realized that in Italy, the um, all practically Technicolo had the system, but no one producer wanted to pay the bill for the silver master. We had a major meeting with the, with the, even for the Italian government, uh, and um, they realized that any film archive, uh, they think the interposity was good enough to archive. And I was pushing, there was not. 2001, a great gentleman, Jörg Gagin, was the manager of the film division in Kodak. Knowing my problem, invited me to, to visit Rochester. He said, well, you see the, the company, what Kodak is, but the results was something they would like to show you. And after they do the general um, tour, he took me in the little room and said, you see this kind of thing, what it is? I said, no, Jörg, what is it? This is your dream. This is, at least at this moment, uh, we don't even have a name. For the moment, we say dots because uh, it's not a tape. My digital optical tape system is the only thing that we can ma imagine. Well, this element coming from NASA uh, and you can uh, escape, practically a sculpture, your, Im your information digitally, and this will become permanent. We tried in our laboratory to test but we reached till 500 years, no more than that. It's still there, the images, so we don't know what. 
And I said, but this is unbelievable. This is really a dream for everyone, for photography, for uh, cinematography, for um, uh, video, for film. Anyone can use this kind of thing that can be amazing. I was so high, I, I said, Ma, Jorg, Ma, how, how many minutes does this kind of element can, uh, can hold? But uh, this is a prototype, probably 20 minutes of material. But you can reach a little more, for example, two hours, um, probably in a few months we can reach that kind of point, no problem. And I said that during the di an incredible dinner that we had together, but this is a, it's practically no a key revolution, if it's K2 or K4, this is Kodak revolution. Practically, George Eastman, if you know this one, will be raised from the tomb and say, finally, I invent to record an image, now you invent something to make this image permanent. And I say, but this material can be put as an hard drive into the, 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 the uh, camera. It practically is a new film. You cannot re, uh, do any double exposure on this kind of thing. And after when you do the, any, any copy, it's permanent because it's digital and, and it is exactly the same quality. You can do editing, you can do visual effect, you can do anything you want. Every single piece is, is, a, is a perfect thing in um, quality, it's permanent, till you arrive at any distribution, till you arrive at the archive. This is something unbelievable. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. A few months later, Georg, uh, um, aging, called me, says, Vittorio, I am retired from Kodak. I said, what's up, Georg? Well, they, they, de they decided that for a new line, uh, they, they want to go in digital. And they put aside the, the, the dot system. I said, are they crazy? I say, what I can tell you, Vittorio, this is also part of my life. Time went by and, uh, and I was keeping, uh, marking my contract with Silver Master Separation. No problem with the big picture in the United States, many problems in Europe. Uh, finally, in the year, uh, in um, 1995, there was the Centenary of Cinema. Uh, the Cinecita International asked me that they want to do an homage to Bernardo Bertolucci's film in Cannes, as they did in the previous year for Fellini, Antonioni, Visconti, and so on. So, Vittorio, you did the most important picture with Bertolucci. Can you supervise the restoration of the picture? And I said, let's be honest, most of them will be no restoration, will be just reprint. Yes, there is a little restoration in color, maybe I just. 1900 probably need the restoration because it had an incredible problem when they put it together, the, the major uh, film in two parts in Europe, but in America was uh, cut at the negative in only one segment. So uh, um, this can be restoration as well, but we need to preserve all the work that I do, otherwise I don't care to do it because one year later is already one year more fading than image or in doing any transfer into any reprint, I, I know this like the conformist or last tango in Paris was uh, fading. So I have to say thanks to Kodak at that moment, the Technicolor, the te Kodak gave me all the print for one print, interposite, internegative, the digital uh, sound, a silver master separation for the picture of Bernardo Bertolucci. I was able to preserve all the color movie that I did with Bernardo Bertolucci in Italy. No one film archive made ever one silver master separation because all this something. So later, only when Rob called me later on, he said, Vittorio, the tragedy that happened with Kodak, now I try to make a resurrection of it. I bought the, um, the patent. Really? Fantastic, mar mar marvelous, blah, blah, blah. And from that moment on, with Bob, we started to I try to help to follow this kind of dream to, you know, everybody in the film industry care how to uh, do pre-production, production, distribution, and after they don't care anymore. Any film archive, uh, they do, they call restoration, even if for reprint, because the Italian government pay a lot of money to restore anything. So better call restoration or reprint. So they have money, but nobody have to do whatever recently I did uh, in, uh, in for the the um, film archive in Rome, uh, last time in Paris. 
I did for the Bologna uh, Film Archive, uh, 1900, The Conformist, one more time. I saw the tragedy that I don't, I, even if I, in, with the digital intermediary, you can uh, arrange many, many other elements to pull out all the information, the, how much I lost already. After that point, there is no any system to really uh, preserve what you've done up to now. My opinion, I, I, I do really believe in these kind of things. And that's one of my will for my uh, end of career, that uh, dots become a, a reality. What is dots? Only one man can tell you what it is. Rob Hammer. <laughs> That's a really great segue. Uh, Vittorio, thank you for an incredibly detailed answer that went into places that I had I had no idea we were going to go. But you immediately bring up dots here. And uh, Rob, for, for our listeners, please give them the, uh, the, the thumbnail overview. Well, 10 minutes. <laughs> 30 seconds. Uh, well, well, okay, DOTS developed by Kodak. Uh, the actual history of it was the, the NSA approached Kodak to develop something that would be non-magnetic to be immune from what they call electromagnetic pulse, which many people are familiar with today since several movies have used that as a, as a story point, uh, to be immune from being destroyed by electromagnetic pulse and uh, would last at least 20 years. When they took, came to Vittorio, they told him about it, said, we've come up with something that'll last, we think, no less than 500 years. And uh, as Vittorio told you, when, when Jorg Egan uh, left Kodak, uh, Kodak shut it down shortly thereafter because Jorg was the, was the dream behind it, keeping it going. I tried for several years to get Kodak to reinvent it and then uh, got encouraged by people that I should, uh, I should go acquire the patents. It took many, many years of negotiations with Kodak, about almost five years. And... Uh, acquired all of the patents. The DOTS technology itself, just to keep it simple, it's visual. And people get confused by that. They, uh, we've even met people, that, people at the CIA who say, you can't record data visually. And I have to remind them that key punch cards or even computer paper tape from back in the 1950s was a visual way of method of storing data. Um, and uh, if you talk to the Library of Congress, uh, uh, great people there like Fenella France and Diane Volk O'Connor will lecture you on how that throughout the history of mankind, the only successful ways of, of preserving images have been visual, be it cuneiform tablets, hieroglyphics, illustrated manuscripts, uh, books, photographs, uh, you know, uh, paintings. Uh, dots is visual in that same way. It is literally, it's a metal alloy tape, you write with a laser, and then you also play back Vittorio's cell phone ring. But uh, no, and then you and you read it with a camera, so it's that elegant that way that you, you it's just image processing uh, to to read the image. Dot sounds pretty amazing. Sounds like it'll last uh, hundreds of years. Recorded with a laser, it's uh, amazing. Hey, in the in the couple minutes we have left here, uh, Vittorio, is there anything else you wanted to say? I want to say just one thing. Before I mentioned to you that when I was uh, pretty young, I saw some image, one image. They really shocked me. It let me understood that uh, why cinema is called the, the Ten Moses, because uh, cinema is nourish itself from the other line, from literature, from painting, from music, so on, so on. And that was the image of Caravaggio, or uh, the stay in a little church called San Luigi dei Francesi in Rome, uh, the calling of San Matthew. Now, that painting was done in 1600. That means uh, almost half of a century ago. And I think it's great that everyone has a chance to see the work of art like a painter, in this case Caravaggio, and nobody can see Wonder Wheel that I did last year in 10 years' time if we don't do something. Thank you very much. That is uh, definitely something to think about. Vittorio and Rob, thank you for being on the show. We'll have you back again. All right. So that was Vittorio Storaro. Uh, Hopefully, I I would love to get him back. He's one of those guys you could just listen to forever. Absolutely. So who is our war story from today? Our war story today is from uh, No Slouch himself, a fantastic cinematographer whose work that I have enjoyed for decades. I love his stuff. His uh, full name that you see in the credits is Newton Thomas Siegel. He goes by Tom Siegel. I honestly, 
I can't wait to give people this interview. And I feel like he's one of those people like Rodney Charters who I, I wish I could just interview him for 17 hours because everything he said was just dripping with brilliance. And, and uh, I, I really, I, I, I just, I just loved hearing what, I mean, honestly, I would just do, I'd love to do a usual suspects commentary with, with Tom. Like, yes, I, I could tell. I could tell you, such you, a you, dork. you, you were, you were uh, obsessing about usual suspects. Yeah. And uh, I know that one question would lead to three with you. About of course. That, so Cause a, I, again, I've seen that movie. If you told me I've seen that movie 60 times I would believe you well the war story is not about usual suspects the war story is uh, oh don't don't give it away okay the war story is awesome okay we'll let it go here you go enjoy the war story from Newton Thomas Siegel and now war stories well you know film is like war like combat there's a lot of uh military analogies we can make in movie making. And I did a movie about war called Three Kings, and for better or worse, the lead actor and the director were often at war. And there was one day when it came to a head. And um, the director, uh, David O. Russell, was frustrated with what some of the extras were doing in the background, sort of, they were non-professional extras, and he kind of ran out into the field and sort of manhandled this one extra, which George uh, Clooney, who was playing Archie Gates, our lead character, took offense to. He was, he was um, you know, appalled by the way that David was kind of manhandling this guy. And they got into a bit of an argument and it started getting heated, and. I didn't realize all of that was going on exactly. Um, I was overdoing something else with the camera and I was right next to our producer and I remember looking over and seeing George and David looking like they were about to come to blows, turning to my producer and saying, you know, I think your leading man is about to get in a fight with the director. And he looked over and he went, you're right. And then I saw him turn around and walk in the opposite direction. So I realized at that point that cinema can be war, and a lot of times you're a lone soldier. And now, short ends. All right, so that was Tom's war story. I can't wait to present everybody uh, the interview with him. I, I think he's uh, he's he's a modern master, and he's he's got some great insight. We were really lucky to do the interview uh, in the same room with him. He was actually going to be the first time that we'd done a you know intercontinental, international, round the world Skype call slash recording with a recorder in the same room, and he was going to send us the file. But sending a Zoom digital audio recorder to India turned out to be a major nightmare. It was uh, lost for like a week, then it was found, and then Customs wouldn't release it to him because we'd addressed it to Tom Siegel instead of Newton Thomas Siegel. And then the hotel, they had him fill out a bunch of paperwork, and then even after he filled out the paperwork, they wouldn't deliver it. And then he was done shooting and left and the recorder finally made it through. That's lame. So then we had to get it sent back, and then that took like another three weeks. So uh, it was maybe the hardest we ever worked to get an interview. And uh, I'm, and I think there was like seventy five dollars in long distance calls, which like <laughs> just to give you an idea of how long that because well, uh, on hold with India was. Uh, oh yeah, man, yeah, that's so. rough. But uh, but anyway, yeah. th- you know. And then uh, we ended up just interviewing him in his outrageously nice house. That's right. Oh and my Sitting God. at his kitchen table and uh, so and awesome, great so, great house. But uh, yeah, he's he's just one of those people who like has been on my radar since you know since I was in film school. Really, he was kind of bursting into into the mainstream scene with you know usual suspects and whatnot anyway we'll save all all my gushing for the actual show hey ben what's your uh, what's your short end this week my short end is because our short end is supposed to be our personal obsession of the week um my wife alicia and i got each other kind of a weird gift for christmas for each other Ooh, kinky yeah it's not that kinky oh, okay. it is the hue lighting system in our house that so, sounds kinky it does does it <laughs> i don't think it sounds kinky at all i don't the know what Hue lighting system. I don't, well, when you say it, when you say it with your creepy voice. Creepy voice. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, with with my hue lighting system, like basically, we replaced every incandescent bulb in the house with a hue light, and they're a little pricey, but they also 
supposedly last 22 years. So, Whoa. so they're going to be around for a while. And I uh, hooked it into HomeKit on my phone so I can literally say, hey, Siri, turn the living room red and all the lights in the living room will turn red. You can program it to do all kinds of different stuff. And you go, how important is it for you to live in a house that looks like Dario Argento's Suspiria in 1977? And well, my, <laughs> pretty answer, important. Yeah. my answer is it is pretty important. Sometimes I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to make the living room blue and the bathroom red and the kitchen, you know, purple. But actually, it's it, with a new baby. It's pretty good to be able to to like be like, "Hey Siri, uh, dim the lights to twenty five percent in the living room," and you don't have to get up and change them. And you don't you know, like if the baby's falling asleep or something like that. You can just kind of do it on your phone, and uh, you can even program routines so it looks like you're home when you're not home. Mm-hmm. Like or basic stuff like my uh, the the light on my front porch turns off when the sun comes up and turns on when the sun goes down on its own and you can there's like a lot of different things you can do with it and it's one of those kind of smart house technologies that i can see turning into uh in, standard in the future well and i and it's like the uses of it are, are just going to increase and people are going to find new interesting ways to to do it it's not just for fun scene setting but the fun scene setting part is pretty cool mm-hmm. i gotta say it's fun to Make my like dim the lights and make them like very saturated blue and then watch TV. It's kind of fun. And in, in my sleep at old child having thing when I have, you know, maybe an hour or two of TV I can ever watch on a, on a, any given day. It's fun to set a set a tone in the whole house. Well, you may want to set the tone for my short end this week, which is uh, a, a, new, a new streaming service. It's a new uh, there's a whole like we, we talked about and mourned the loss of uh, previous streaming service when film struck. Uh, Filmstruck when Alonzo was on the show. Uh, but there's a new one which has not exactly taken its place, but it does have a lot of archive catalog titles of television as well as some some big movies. And it's it kind of spans the gamut. You'll find stuff like Memento on there and Gattaca and Drive, but you'll also find things like Pacific Blue. If you uh, remember that t- television Drive. show, yes, the the television show Pacific Blue. Oh know, yeah. yeah, and then like the Ultimate Dance Competition and uh, all kinds of other sort of like really obscure TV shows that I have never heard of here. But then uh, some classic stuff like The Rifleman. So you know, and, all- and what is the service? What is it called? This service. I is- must know. Tell me what the service is. Okay, it's basically Amazon Prime Part Two. Whoa! Except it's free, and. So you're not an Amazon subscriber, but you can watch all this stuff through IMDb. So IMDb calls it free dive. So it's the IMDb free dive. But I understand IMDb owned by Amazon. Amazon uh, already has a streaming service. So basically you're getting all this stuff for free. Here's the catch with commercials. And I think we're increasingly moving towards this world where if you're willing to spend money, you don't have to see a commercial. If you want something for free, you're watching advertising and uh, it already exists on Hulu. It's already existed in some, some other places, but now this is something that's going to be in yet other, other evidence that crackle was way ahead of everybody. That's right. Crackle. You can subscribe to and not have to pay, see an ad. No, no. Crackle is all pay all, all ads. All ads. Everything so, is ad supported. Like when I, I remember being like, Oh, Netflix, like no ads and like all the things. And, and then crackle was like 100% ad supported. Like everything on crackle is free, but it's ad supported. So we're entering into a, an interesting era because if you can afford to, you don't have to look at the ads. And really, then your dollars of paying that service are directly going to support the content because these service providers are, by and large, now creating that content. Uh, Apple has announced that they're going to be seriously getting into the game. Uh, Amazon is winning awards and they're re-upping their uh, original programming budget. Uh, Netflix is already legendary for spending like $6 billion I in wonder how long it's going to take. I, like, I wonder if Apple is going to be able to like penetrate and be a player immediately because i feel like netflix and amazon both had some failed attempts at original series before they kind of i mean like amazon i feel like it was like four years where they were just doing stuff like alpha house or whatever and it was like eh, I, I see where you're going but it's not really catching fire and then one day they had transparent and oh boy you know uh facebook is getting into the game i understand facebook is going to have some programming uh YouTube has already got some programming. Now, interesting though, some of the stuff that was on YouTube Red, they're now moving into regular YouTube. Yeah. So this this world, a movie of, that I was up for that was a YouTube Red original is now on regular. I, I didn't get the job, so I'm not going to name it, but uh, it's now on regular old YouTube. 
Abe Martinez, who's been on the podcast, shot a show for YouTube Red. It's now on regular YouTube. You can watch. It is sort of a television uh, television series of the Karate Kid called Cobra Kai. It is Abe a, shot that. Abe shot that. Well, that yeah, show is awesome. Oh, right on. Yeah, he's he was working on that show. I didn't so. know that Abe was the DP on that. I don't know if he was the DP for all of it or maybe the pilot, but I do remember him shooting it for sure. And I can I'm sure I can go to IMDb and look it up right now. That's but, impressive. But yeah, it's it's but really you cool. Won't. Uh, well, I am on IMDb this exact second, so uh, I can tell you right now. Mar- Abe Mar- Abraham Martinez. Here's a huge commercial for IMDb. IMDb, you should sponsor our show. Really. Hey, IMDb. <laughs> I'm on your website literally multiple times every day okay. and, and have been for over a decade. Uh, boom, boom, boom. He was B camera operator, 10 episodes, Cobra Kai. Let's see. Cine- what happens when I click on cinematographer? Okay, so it was B camera operator. It wasn't cinematographer. Still, that's pretty I, cool. I, yeah, it, was, it was very cool. Yeah, I mean, Cobra Kai, I watched the first two episodes. I thought it was fantastic. Stroke I of genius. It, that, it, it's a real stroke of genius. Yeah, uh, uh, if you haven't seen it, you know, here's a little bonus for the short ends. Go watch that first episode of Cobra Kai. You can watch it for free on YouTube, on your smart TV, or on your laptop, on your phone, any of those things. But b- bigger screen is better. Sweet. All right, so let's wrap this thing up. So, Ilya. Where can people find you? You can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. Uh, you can also find me over on the uh, Instagrams and the Facebooks and all that sort of stuff. And definitely follow or support or whatever you do on Instagram to repost. Or I'm I'm revealing how terrible you can't I am. You can repost on Instagram, although there's an app that allows you to do it. If you, you know what? I, I just want people to tag us. They want just to like, just, at, just like. Just, okay, just you can like us. us. You can, you can, yeah, you could tag us in pictures. I, 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 it's if, a, you ha- if you have a picture of a camera of any camera, it's a series just tag of us. tubes. That's it is. A, <laughs> <laughs> so it's at the Cinepod, and uh, that's instant Instagram. And uh, Ben, where can people find you? Uh, I am at BenRockOnline.com. But uh, you know, if you really just want to shoot the shit, go to Twitter, where I am at Neptune Salad. Neptune Salad. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram, where I am Benjamin underscore Rock, because I didn't really think the Instagram thing was going to take off when I came up with my name on there. And uh, that's about it. I, anywhere else you can you can find me in most of those places. Thanks very much for listening. We'll be back soon with Tom Siegel. But before we do that, before we leave. No, oh, wait. There's what we, did I forget now? We also want oh, we got to thank people. Damn it. So uh, so let's thank let's thank our producer Alana Cody. Alana Cody, without whom I got I, I like we would be going at the glacial pace that we were going at for the first whatever seventeen years that we were doing this. Uh, it was five, but yes, has it been five years? It was. Oh my god. Okay, so uh, uh, <laughs> Alana Cody, Kay's Alatrachi. Yes, the, uh, go to musicbykays.com and hire Kay's, or at least just tell Kay's you like his work. Just just go, hey, Kay's, love your work. You can contact him on his website. It's great. He'll, he'll be so happy. Just tell him that you heard it on the Cinematography Podcast. We'd like to thank the newest addition to the Cinematography Podcast family, Abby Corbetta, who is our newest editor who edited this episode. So that wraps up episode 29. We will see you on episode 30 with Tom Siegel. Exciting. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.